independent sources of information. He wrote a very, very nice article. He's an aviation specialist. He took it to his editor at this major metropolitan newspaper, and he was told, sorry, we don't do articles on UFOs. <laughs> that, you know, I've reported before, I think, on your programs, but this is an astonishing phenomenon yeah. that we see very clearly from our vantage point in Seattle. The local... I stopped, and I went back there the next day, and I didn't see any remains or anything, but it's still... Uh, I mean, I've never seen anything like it before. Mm-hmm. And how long did it last, all told, do you estimate, please? About 15 or 20 seconds, I'd say. Uh-huh. And where were you at the time of the sighting, please? I was on uh, Interstate 95, uh, right around Green Cove Springs, Florida, which is between St. Augustine and Jacksonville, headed southbound, came from the east and went west. So it seemed to it spent most of the time above my car, then when it went west where I could actually see it, it was about... Uh, Maybe 75 or 100 feet in the air above the tree line there, and, and uh, that's the last time I saw it. It was over like a part forest, part field kind of thing. No, no houses or any other things around. It was pretty much the middle of nowhere. Oh, okay. Another thing I want to say, when, yeah. the, uh, the, when the light was surrounding my car, mm -hmm. it was so bright that I think it may have been like directly at the top of my car because I could see it in all directions at the same intensity, and also mm -hmm. I could barely see my dashboard. It was that. It was that bright, huh? Yeah, and I almost crashed the car because I couldn't see the road mm -hmm. at all. So the, by the time it had gone west, uh, you know, I almost ran off the road. And, well, I was off the road. I almost ran into the guardrail. Wow. That was within the last 10 days. And the one thing not illustrated in this cut, I talked with this gentleman for about 15 or 20 minutes, and he described in fine detail some of his impressions of what was going on. There was a tractor trailer behind his car on Interstate 95. Probably, he estimates, about 10 car lengths behind him. And his impression was that tractor trailer locked up his brakes. There must be some truck driver out there somewhere in the United States who probably was witness to this incident. And if anybody's listening and knows that truck driver, we'd sure like to talk to him. We sure would. Uh, by the way, I should point out, for those who are used to listening to Linda Moulton Howe in this segment... Uh, Linda Moulton Howe is down with a serious case of the flu and has been since last Monday with a temperature of about 102, the same thing I went through. And so uh, that accounts for Linda's absence uh, this evening and, as a matter of fact, your presence, uh, Peter. Sure, happy to have you here. It's delightful to be here. I'm missing Linda's report. I look forward to it every week. Well, she'll be back next week. No, it's your brother, Larry. That is in itself, by the way, a story uh, I have never seen. Never seen a flu year like the one we're having this year. Hospitals are packed, emergency rooms are overloaded. It's really strange. Yep. Anyway, um, you have a number of audio clips uh, for us. We do indeed, and I think we'll be playing them throughout the program. And one thing I'd like to preface with, too, Art, is that I would like to release some information about those sightings over Arizona on the 13th of March that I have revealed in only very limited circles in the past, but it will be the first time that we will share some interesting in information or more accurately certain observations as to what was going on across the United States that night. We're talking about the Phoenix sightings of March. The Phoenix 13th. sightings of the 13th of March, 1997, that so many people are trying to call military flares and lasers and other such, uh, I feel, nonsense. And uh, we've been working on this for now about nine months, and we've come up with certain observations that I think our, our listeners tonight will find intriguing. We're sure that we don't have all the answers as to what went on there, but it was a genuinely bizarre incident that occurred over in Phoenix about nine months ago. Well, we'll be talking about that later on. All right. kind of bizarre interaction between two young people up in Standish, Maine. It's now under investigation. In fact, I gather active investigation. It looks like a classic nighttime interaction between two young people and some very strange craft that was seen hovering over a lonesome highway, and there are many of them up in Maine. A lonesome highway in Maine 
just about 6.30 last Wednesday night, East Coast time. Hmm. And I think in about a minute or a minute and a half, our listeners will get the impression of what appears to us serious-minded ufologists to be taking place almost constantly in this country. Let me play this cut about, I think, a minute and 20 seconds. All right. I'll, I'll tell you what, Peter. I'm not sure we're going to have time for that. Uh, we're going to go to a bottom of the hour break here very, very shortly, and I don't want to have to interrupt it. Yeah. So we can do that uh, after we come back. That'll be fine. Um, listen, give me a little clue about w what you were talking about with respect to Phoenix. Yeah. It's very important when analyzing anything to have sort of a broad scope of what's going on elsewhere that possibly may be related to the primary incident. There were certain things that it took us months to discover that perhaps were taking place across the United States in the reconnaissance forces, also with regard to Cheyenne Mountain. Cheyenne and, Mountain. And the, the security level or the level of military preparedness that may have been declared that night. One of the things I'm going to do is request of our listeners... Are you talking about the DEFCON level? The DEFCON level, the defense condition... It is our belief. And all right, have... all right. That's, that's where I want to stop you. <laughs> okay. We're going to hang up the audience here. Um, stay right where you are. Peter Davenport. The Phoenix. Was simultaneously going on at Cheyenne Mountain and elsewhere? We'll ask in a moment. And how to see them is uh, stuck uh, with a rider truck in the state of Virginia with a bad tire in the middle of a snowstorm. And he called us on a cellular phone. So there you have it. Um, Mark Smith will not be with us this evening. He will be tending to his bad back, trying to get his vehicle out of the snow in Virginia, and we will schedule him for a future dreamland. Just thought you'd want to know. In the meantime, go to my website and take a look at the link I've got up there. If you jump over to that, you'll see what human auras really look like, courtesy of whoever put that website up. It is a superb example of human auras. Um, that's at www.artbell.com, and it's there right now. Go take a look. In the meantime, Peter Davenport is here. And I guess to keep uh, the train of continuity on track, we will pick up with the whole Phoenix business. Now, March 13th, something gigantic was over the city of Phoenix. Two million people below. Something really, really big. It wasn't flares. And apparently there was more than just that going on at that moment. What else was happening, Peter? Cheyenne Mountain, what's going on? Yeah. Well, I should get my disclaimers in first, Art. All of what I'm about to say may be the product of pure coincidence. We don't know. It's an angle that we have been working on quietly for the last six or eight months, ever since that massive sighting over Phoenix on the 13th of March. But there are four things that happened that night. Whether they're related or not, we're still trying to put the pieces together. But this is how we look at the, the situation. Of course, the major sighting over Phoenix, in my opinion, it was the most massive, most dramatic sighting in the history of modern ufology. Sure. That makes it the last 50 years. Roughly 8.30, I think, Pacific or uh, Arizona time to 10 o'clock or 10-something. That's right. The first sighting was over Henderson, Nevada at 6.55 Nevada time, actually 7.55 Arizona time. The next report was from Paulden, Arizona at 8.16 and it took it about 15 minutes to get down over downtown Phoenix. But that was a major sighting. There's no question about it. The second incident that we have had reported to us, and it is unconfirmed at this time, in fact, that's part of the reason I'm revealing it tonight, is to solicit any kind of evidence that any of our listeners may have that might help us confirm or deny some of these incidents. But the second incident that occurred is that a major U.S. reconnaissance satellite went offline, that is, went dark, for reasons that, as far as we know, were not understood at all well and may still not be well understood by the National Reconnaissance Office, which I presume is the entity in our government that supervises those things. Now, let me understand. During the sightings, 
of March 13th. You're saying one of our KH series satellites went offline? I don't know which satellite. All we have learned from an individual in the satellite business is that one of their quote, quote, birds went offline. Whether it was a, one of the KH-10 or 11 or KH-11 or 12 series, I have no way of knowing. Of course, the reconnaissance forces are fairly tight-lipped about these things, and for good reason. So you, um, can, can you, you say you got this from somebody in the satellite business? That is the ultimate source, is my understanding. Okay. The third incident of interest, and we have not been able to confirm this either, but it comes to us from what appears to be a reliable source, mm -hmm. is that U.S. military forces were put on an elevated state of military readiness on the night of the 13th of March, 1997. That was the same night, of course, that the sightings occurred over Arizona. An elevated state of alert. Not only an elevated state of alert, but it is reported to us, unconfirmed again, that they went from a normal DEFCON 5, Defense Condition 5, which is normal peacetime state of alert, to a DEFCON 3 state of readiness. They jumped right over a 4 and went to 3? That is our understanding, again unconfirmed. I wish to uh, underscore that point. But you may remember that on coast to coast, you broke the news back in mid-April, I think it was April 16th, that they had gone from a state of DEFCON 5 to DEFCON 4. They closed the doors at Cheyenne Mountain and oh, there so was, on. Oh, there was no question about that. It that was that was during the A-10 uh, incident. That's right. It was shortly after that. They closed down Cheyenne Mountain to all visitors, and they were serious about it. In this case, on the 13th of March, about a month earlier, they went from DEFCON 5 to DEFCON 3. It is reported to us. Now, that is interesting. The, the fourth... uh, now, wait a minute now. Um, they say that uh, UFOs are no threat, no threat to national security. Yes. That's what they say. That's the official line, isn't it? It has been for 50 years from the U.S. government, and I think it's time that we get some answers from those people. I would presume there'd be no way to get an answer on this. In other words, you could file Freedom of Information Acts until the cows come home, that and they correct. wouldn't tell you when they increased the DEFCON uh, status by, uh, uh, by, by two numbers. There's no way. I've actually approached some senior people in the Air Force to ask whether, in fact, defense condition statuses are published publicly, <laughs> and they guffawed. They said, we can sometimes release that information if we wish to do so, mm. but we are by no means required to do it. They can go all over the map with those defense conditions, and the American public would never know uh, the truth of the matter. So again, while the incident was going on in Phoenix, the DEFCON level was rising at Cheyenne Mountain. That is a possibility. Good heavens. That is what we think may have happened. And if there's anybody out there listening to us who could either confirm that fact or prove to us that it was not the case, we would welcome the information in either case. And I encourage people, please do not break the law to get that information to us. In other words, if there are people out there who have made secrecy, secrecy pledges, we do not ask them to come forward. No, don't with break the them. We, we have no way to protect you. That's right. But if they can direct us to publicly available information that would give us evidence or hopefully proof that would help us confirm some of these things, we would be more than grateful. And one thing I feel compelled to add to that, Art, is that please, if you call the UFO hotline in Seattle, and I'll give that number out before the program's over, please recognize that this number may be monitored. We have no way of knowing whether that's the case or not, but do not uh, risk your own reputation or job or safety or any of that to get that information to us. Oh, I'd lay money on it. That's my feeling, too, but we try to avoid those paranoiac thoughts up here. After all, we make it very clear that any of the data we have is available to anybody. It doesn't matter whether we're monitored or not from our standpoint, really. There is another uh, Cheyenne Mountain story that broke, oh, I don't know, a month or two ago. And I have no confirmation of this as well. I don't know if you've heard about it, but I was told that there were quite a number of employees or people who worked at Cheyenne Mountain, uh, apparently civilian employees who worked at Cheyenne Mountain, who uh, 
stumbled on some information that scared the hell out of them, Peter. And they took their families and left uh, Cheyenne Mountain and went to South America. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know whether you've heard that story or not. I have. I've seen it on the Internet, Art. Uh, there, there, there you are. Reports. There you are. Uh, so that uh, that would be another one that I would like to have confirmed. If anybody has any information about that at all, uh, I would have them contact you, and we will give that number out here shortly. So Cheyenne Mountain went to a higher DEFCON status is the story. Uh, what a coincidence, Peter. Well, those are the first three of four coincidences. The fourth one is what I consider to, the, to be the bone crusher, if in fact it's true. And again, I say I am, this is surmise on my part, but the same night that the incident occurred over Arizona, 13th of March we're talking about again, was the very night that President Clinton injured his knee to the degree that he required extensive surgery the next morning. My goodness, I, I recall. Yeah, that was the night, and it occurred to us immediately, we... It, it piqued our interest, that's for sure. Now, let's see. If there's something seen over a major city, if the DEFCON alert uh, is suddenly jumped a couple of numbers, then it would follow that somebody back in Washington would tr grab the president and put him into a helicopter or something. Yes. That is what immediately occurred to us. It is part of the reason that we did not reveal this information or even conjecture about it now for nine months, we have been working at trying to confirm these things. We still have not been able to confirm them, but if my theory is correct, and it is only but a theory, this is the scenario that I see in my mind's eye. An incident occurs over Arizona. The evidence is overwhelming, and I have a tape that I can't play on national television or national radio art. We are fairly certain that that incident over Arizona precipitated the scrambling of two F-15 fighters out of Luke Air Force Base. Oh, really? Now, the commanders of Luke laugh and guffaw in response to this query. They say, but we are only an F-16 base. They are exactly correct. I accept what they say on that point, except for the following exception. There is a branch of the Air Force that I believe is referred to as ready alert. Whenever the president or vice president or any important dignitaries fly over the United States, they are chaperoned by fighters. Absolutely. They fly, they fly cap over the, the uh, individual's aircraft. That program, to the best of my knowledge, and this is unconfirmed, to the best of my knowledge, it's referred to as a ready alert unit. There are such units, small units, all across the United States prepared to scramble at a moment's notice to chaperone the president's aircraft. Now, we believe that there may have been, or may still be, a radio alert unit at Luke Air Force Base. They used to fly F-15s. So it is not illogical to argue, I feel, that Luke Air Force Base would have all the hardware, everything necessary to support a small unit of F-15s. The other line of reasoning I apply is that if you are a commander assigned the task of protecting the president's aircraft, right. the aircraft of choice would be a twin-engine aircraft. That's the F-15. They have two engines in them. Correct. In lieu of the F-16, which is a single-engine aircraft, presumably if you're a commander looking forward to your next star or promotion and or a comfortable retirement, you would never want to have to apologize for the president for not being able to scramble aircraft to protect Air Force One, and you would not choose an F-16 to fly that mission under normal circumstances. Now, I am groping in the dark. I am conjecturing. This is pure surmise. It's important that our listeners understand that. I was an Air Force brat, but for one year as a kid, <laughs> and I've never served in the Air Force. What I'm applying is logic here. Now, the scenario I see in my mind's eye is if that object that was over downtown Phoenix and its wingspan was measured in miles, or whether one, two, or three miles wide, we don't know. But it was intercepted by one of those two F-15s that photographed it with its gun camera. Now, under a circumstance like that, I presume word would get back to Cheyenne Mountain. Cheyenne Mountain would send word to the White House or to wherever the president was at the time. And the cover story or the, the report 
is that the president was in the home of Greg Norman. I think he's an Australian golfer who has a home in Florida. And he tripped on the carpet in the wee hours of the morning. We don't know the circumstances of that, but I must say, at the time of that report in the papers, it seemed as though the White House was attempting to gloss over the details of that incident. Oh, they absolutely did, yes. They didn't. You know, under normal circumstances, you'd have photograph, uh, photographs of the stairs where he fell. There would be fiber analysis of the carpet, the uh, marks on the, the banister where he hit his head, et cetera, et cetera. It, I speak facetiously, of course. So obviously you think they were trying to spirit the president out, and he tripped and hurt himself. And then we found out the next day, after everything had quieted it back down and the DEFCON, uh, uh, DEFCON numbers returned to five. Yeah. That is a possible scenario, and I seek information if there's anybody out there who can help us either confirm or deny any of these alleged facts or surmises that I've revealed here, we would welcome the information. And uh, the number? The number in Seattle of the hotline is area code 206-722-3000. And they can contact me there, or they can send us a correspondence if they'd like to use the mail system. Our address here in Seattle is the National UFO Reporting Center, of course, and our P.O. Box is 45623 University Station, Seattle, Washington, and the zip code is 98145. All right, and we'll get that on again later. I uh, everybody will get a pencil and a paper ready. Uh, Peter, in the meantime, something occurred in Maine just a few days ago, and we have just enough time to get that on. Yeah. This was a, an interaction between a young gal and with her brother uh, with something up over Standish, Maine, let me just play the tape, and then if we have time left over, we can talk about it. Sure, Here go we ahead. Go. We break in. And my brother saw something that he thought was an airplane, and he said he thinks that's an airplane. And I said, I don't know, I can't see it. And then we got there. Like, it wasn't too high up in there. It looked like maybe three telephone poles up in there. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't moving, so I pulled over, put my hazards on, and looked up above me, and there was, it was almost, it looked like it was almost shaped like a square, like a diamond, but with a very vague, like, maybe octagon thing around it. Uh -huh. And then there was four bright white, yellowish, really bright lights on each corner. Uh -huh. And then in the middle of it, there was a blinking red light. And then my light shut off, and I didn't shut them off on my own. Uh-huh. And then... I got a really weird feeling, and I couldn't move. I was just staring at it, and then all of a sudden, all the lights went off, and then I blinked and looked over, and it had moved across the street over some trees because we had gone out of the car to look at it, and the lights went out. So when I looked up again, it had moved because we thought it had gone away, and it was across the street, like, way over with its lights on, but this time it was moving. Uh -huh. When you said the lights went out, does that mean the lights on your car went out? Yeah, the lights on my car went out. Uh-huh. And I was feeling, like, really tingly and stuff. Mm -hmm. My insides were feeling, like, really tingly. Yeah. And I couldn't move. Mm hmm And then, so, we waited, watched it, and it was just, like, hovering, like, over us, just, like, not moving, just, like, swaying like, side to side. And then it, the lights went off, so we thought it was gone. And then when we looked back up, it had gone across the street, diagonally, but there was, like, no noise or nothing. Mm -hmm. And it was just, like, going. It was very odd. Okay. And that was four old, nights ago. How old was that young lady? That young lady is 17 years of age. She reports to us. She was with her, I believe, younger brother on Route 114 near Standish, Maine. Boy. That is out west of Portland, Maine, 20 miles from the New Hampshire border, straight north of Kennebunkport. And that was four nights ago. Four we have had about four or five reports similar to this since mid-December last month. Uh, from the same area or different areas? From all across the United States. All across the U.S.? Yep. Uh, this one, we had one from Ada, Oklahoma. I may play that tape uh, later in the program. It's a pretty dramatic interaction between two young teenagers out near Ada, Oklahoma, and something that was directly above their tent. We're getting reports like this 
fairly frequently, Art. Uh, formerly, in past years, they've been very rare. But they're coming in with a greater frequency, I will say, than has been the case in the past. Well, that's one of the questions I always ask, uh, the frequency of these reports. And now you're saying they appear to be increasing. We've had a pulse of them in the recent past, that's for sure. Well, listen, what you've told me about the March 13th Phoenix business is big news, Peter. It's really big news. I feel that too, Art. Uh, so we'll see if we get some feedback. In the meantime, I'm going to play this incredible Michigan tape uh, after the top of the hour, and we'll get back in touch with you into the next hour and take calls and play more recordings, all right? Very good. All right, take care. That's uh, Peter Davenport, and he will be back with us after we play one of the most incredible recordings you will have ever heard. It's raw audio. Prepare your recorders. Get ready, because I've never heard anything like this in my life. You're going to have to listen carefully, because it is raw. This is Dreamland. It essentially speaks for itself. It is raw audio of an encounter over Michigan that, as Peter said, thousands, tens of thousands of people saw and was seen on radar as well. Uh, I couldn't possibly impart it to you in uh, any more of a dramatic manner than it is imparted on this tape. I will uh, attempt to cover up names and addresses as they occur because I'm going to play the full tape. If you appreciate the epic to want to record what you're about to hear. In some cases, it's going to be difficult to hear. This is raw audio, and it speaks for itself. One center. This tape is made from the unaltered master tape. The date, 3, 8, 94. The time, 21, 30 hours. Also recorded will be dispatch conversation with the National Weather Service personnel. Have you heard anything about these lights that are flickering up here in the, what is it, the east, east, southeast area? It's like a group. It's there. It looks like a string of fishing pipes that's way up in the sky. And we wondered if you had heard anything about it. Not a thing. Wow, you might have had somebody take a look. It's different. I've never seen anything like it. Um, but it's right out east, southeast, and way up, and it's just like a circle of a lot of different lights flickering. And it's different than any airplane. I <laughs> okay, your address, please. All right, we're not we're not going to allow the uh, address to be given out over the air. We're going to cover that up. Looking out the front of our house, it's. when you're coming down 16th Street, right to Country Club Road. If you look to your immediate, just, just to your lower right, they're right there in the sky. This is something we've never seen before. Okay, we'll have somebody check it out. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Bye. You're going to hear a lot of this in between calls. Just random tape noise. You're hearing a 911 dispatcher. 911? Yeah, um, is this the police? We do the dispatching phone service or something. Okay, um, I don't know if you guys do anything on UFOs at all. I got real... Okay, again, a cut and a wait. Someone's going up and down. Hold on. As well, by now the 911 dispatcher is becoming a believer. And you're at 
419 stretch. All right, we're going to hold that, too. Uh, oh, okay, we'll have somebody stop by and see you. Okay. All okay? Thanks, Thank you. By now, he's wondering what's going on. Central Charlie 21, sending one down. <laughs> Now listen very carefully. 911, you guys busy? I call that's not a really emergency. We just called about the meal flows up. Mm -hmm. They're out there. Taking yeah. airplanes. Yeah, we've got a car on the way over there, let's see, right now. Uh, I've got a couple other calls. Really? They see them too? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where are they now? I mean, are they they're just kind of hanging there. They came up as a group. I, I bet some kind of hot air balloon or uh, healing balloon lights on. Um, okay. Yeah, we've got a current way. He was coming from the downtown area, so he... They're, they're kind of hanging in the general area. It's like maybe the wind might have broke them apart like they would be balloons, maybe. I don't know. Okay, but, so we got a call from uh, Stratford Way, and that's where he's heading first, and then he's going to head over to yours. Okay, yeah, we, uh, they're dead south of us now. South of you? Yeah, we're on 16th Country Club. Okay. All right, thanks. All right, thank you. Yep, I yep. get by now, the 911 fellow wants to know what's going on. He's about to make a call. Sandra, there's um, Yeah, this is a non-emergency, so feel free to cut me off if something comes in. And I feel kind of silly calling, but my son and sister that I call, is, is there any Air Force airplanes or helicopters flying around in Allegan or Ottawa County tonight? Well, we've had reports out Stratford Way in that area of life, and they're checking it out. Stratford Way? Yep. Now, where would that be? Checking it out. They say it's something to do with ra uh, radio towers down in the area. It has something to do with what? Radio towers down in the area. They were in the air. Why don't you tell them what you saw? Okay, I was at a real high hill, mm -hmm. right on the, the county line there. And it was like at a 45 degree angle to the ground. Uh -huh. There was like probably four or five lights, and they were all flashing right in a row from the top all the way down to the bottom. Uh -huh. And sitting there for a while and then it leveled off and then it then it moved southeast it was up in the air quite a bit okay yeah we got an officer down the area checking on it right now okay but, okay it took off real fast okay yeah we'll let him know all right okay thank you bye bye all right by now the 911 dispatcher is getting very very curious about what's going on and again he's about to start to try to make calls to figure out what is going on and now that's what you're going to hear. He's now uh, dialing up uh, what he thinks is the weather service. All right, so he decides that that is not a good number, and so he's going to call a number where he can reach a human being. That's what th you're listening to the 911 dispatcher. Here we go.
day before. Now they're on uh, an alternating blinking pattern. Uh -huh. That's what he's writing it off to, but a couple of our people, are, or the citizens, are saying, well, yeah, but they seem to be moving. Well, are you standing in the same spot you were before? No. Well, that would make a move to me, you know. I mean, yeah. if you're standing on one side of your house, you go to the other, yeah, they're going to give me a different location. So I was just kind of curious if you noticed anything or... Turn down there. Let's see. That looks like um, it's up about maybe. Well, it'll disappear. But it was up about 6,000 feet in about. Um, could have been in plane. I don't know. But it was pretty big. Wait a minute.
they're about, they're separated by about, um, looks like about 5,000 feet in height and about maybe, uh, um, just, an officer just sent me a message here, he says, uh, about, about maybe, uh, they're separated by about 50 kilometers. difficult to hear here we are going to pause and I will give you the remainder of this raw audio tape have we got you interested you're listening to a National Weather Service radar operator who incidentally after doing all of this according to Peter Davenport was arbitrarily transferred out of his job we will have the remainder of this when we come back in a moment from the high desert the area that will answer
the Kingdom of Nine with Art Bell. Good morning, everybody. If you would look at a map and reference the areas that this uh, radar operator is talking about, you would find they're about 25 miles apart and form nearly a perfect triangle. We'll have the balance of this report in a moment. The real thing from Michigan. Listen carefully. situation where the um, a demand at the National Weather Center doesn't believe that he's been talking to the people at the 911 service. Well, Kent County Department of Aeronautics, you have reached our automated attendance. Our offices are currently closed. That was attempt number one. Now, listen carefully. Yeah, this is um, the National Weather Service in Muskegon. I was calling to make sure that the person that called me was, was really a, uh, a sheriff from out of, out of a county and not a whole. He was one of our dispatchers. Oh, okay. Calling about the... Uh, right. We've been past... chasing them all over down that way. Pardon? We've been chasing lights down all over down that way. So, so what, what really is going on? We um, don't know. We, I still got a car out in the area. Can you hold on for a second? Sure. This has never been played on the air before. Did Ken fill you in on the weather service at all, Jim? Hello? Hi. Yeah, okay. Um, so what, 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 what were these things look, uh, what do they look like? I don't know. We got a report of something going through the air with lights on it horizontally, three to four lights, going at a high rate of speed up and down and all over the sky. I bet we've had five or six calls, right? And they've all been in the South Holland area. South Holland. Yep, from South Holland down to Overijssel, down in that area. Oh, Overijssel, right? Okay. And um, what color were the lights? No, I didn't really get what color they were. Okay. Yeah. Well, I did pick up. Um, I picked up about three to four um, blips, and they were big. They were. Because planes usually show up like as a little little pinpoint um, that moves uh, through the uh, on the scope. But these were these were bigger. These were about the size of half a half a thumbnail on the um, on the scope, and uh, um, and they were up about uh, between five and twelve thousand feet, and they had real strong returns with them. And there were three of them. They they bounced all over the place, but the, the general movement. Uh, Chicago, they, um, I pretty much uh, gave up looking at them uh, when it reached uh, just southern 
I did I did see something and I haven't I've never seen anything like that before. Um I don't know, you know, what kind of, if it's uh, some kind of an atmospheric phenomenon. I hear they have, uh, um, I hear the uh, uh, the uh, northern lights is going on. I got a call from uh, um, from Manson saying that the uh, the northern lights are really um, dancing around, really bright. Oh, really? Yeah. So. Okay. Well, they're either, they're stadium. I think it seems to me like the last week I said it was moving like to the southeast from Holland towards Allegan County. I wish I had I wish we had a recording of, of what I could see. Yeah. Well, you know, actually there they are they are there's some blips showing up on the computer part and this is being recorded, so oh, good. Uh, there is gonna be a recording of it, so if they can you might be able to see a, um um a movement on this if, if we can play this back. So. Okay. All right. Well, if we get any more, we'll let you know also. Okay. Let me, uh, yeah, please do. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, bye bye. bye. All right, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. That uh, has never been heard in totality before. And as I said at the beginning, I think that it pretty well speaks for itself. So I will have no further comment, and you can absorb it. Uh, hopefully, you got to record it. There is one other little item that I would like to play for you. Uh, you heard um, earlier tonight, uh, you heard Peter suggest that the Air Force does not put up aircraft to go chase UFOs. That may not be totally correct. And I offer you the following that was sent to me uh, to be able to play on the air, and I did once before. Uh, the following comes uh, is a recording, again, a raw recording from Edwards Air Force Base in California. It was a night they were seeing things. Listen carefully. I have another red light and uh, green light combination in sight moving very rapidly over the field at this time. I, I'm going to check on my rap time to see if they have any movement in here. Phoenix is, huh? Hey, so Lance here. Say, have you all had any uh, reports of unknown flying objects over there? No, we haven't. Oh, okay, I was wondering. We supposedly are having quite an invasion over here. <laughs> what area? In our area? Uh, no, it's over around uh, Victorville and Edwards there. And I was wondering if any of your uh, sites or any of your bunches over there have called anything in. No. Uh, okay, fine. Thank you much. Right. right. Four of them at eight. Yes, sir. Um, three on the bottom side. Two up. Yes, sir. Count that. Uh,
I sent an interceptor? Listen carefully. Yeah, well, let's tell you how it's managed around here. Let's see if we can dig up something. It, 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 it's definitely uh, changed its color from white to red, or white to green, and uh, red. Yeah, the red flash is strong enough to block out uh, the red color for the naked eye. So it appears to be white to color from white to green to red. Can you get any form out of this thing, what it looks like? I haven't checked it. It's, it's, it appears to move a lot closer to it than that thing with the glasses. Uh, is it getting brighter or dimmer or what? Quite a bit. Is it getting brighter? Mm -hmm. Well, it uh, appears to be quite a bit brighter. Uh, it's hard to tell sitting in a lighted room looking out a window at it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, Eli, is this a chief controller? Friendly and Helia. Right, uh, Major Struble here. I, I've got some uh, optics painting uh, over Edwards at 11.5. Uh, uh, Edwards is observing them from the ground. Uh, two towers observing them, and uh, we're carrying them on height and radar. Uh -oh, they're flashing white, green, and red. Edwards is observing And we have a track on them, Kilo 157. They're heading west. Uh, they're at this time uh, approximately uh, 20 miles west of Edwards. At 11.5, there was a, uh, we talked to the center, they didn't have anything on it, but heading west uh, of the area at 14 grand, and he had no joy on the center, query the bird. Uh, let's see, I'm holding them now uh, with the bird that flew through the area. Uh, 50 miles west of Edwards. 50 west. Yeah. Now, uh, talk to the sergeant, uh, the UFO people at uh, Edwards, uh, the first place I should tell you that uh, Norton UFO referred this back to Edwards as being in the area. Uh, the lieutenant uh, is the UFO responsible officer in bed three miles away. The first place should, uh, doesn't uh, have any authority except just to report to us. They haven't uh, requested a scramble or anything. Uh, my question would be then, do you uh, want us to uh, shake this lieutenant out of the pad and uh, see if he wants to request, uh, Edward said they had no capability of uh, space out and space going up and looking. Uh, we're painting a lot out there and everybody's seeing it. So, uh, do you think we ought to shake this lieutenant out of the pad and uh, space out? See if he wants to request uh, we go up and take a look? It might be... Well, they haven't raised him yet, eh? They haven't called him? Well, I told him to hold off until I talk to you. Uh -huh. The sergeant is yeah. reluctant to call him until he feels like he uh, needs to because it's being 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Uh, if you have such a good paint and everything on him, uh, I think it would be worthwhile if you give him a call. Yeah, that's my feeling, too. Right. And then if he... Uh, in that area, you know, if he should request a uh, scramble... Uh, well, you'd probably take one of the guard birds, uh, one of the douches up, I think. Yeah, that could be okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right, there you are. Uh, uh, all I give in the end is uh, special curse team for an unsafe car. Okay, let's uh, put a special curse team in a 157. Oh, 157. All okay, together? Right, thank you. And so they scrambled and went up and took a look, and that's what occurred at Edwards. So if you have any question in your mind about whether or not uh, the Air Force does respond to things that it sees uh, when it paints them with radar, there you are. All right, well, that has uh, been quite an hour, and I hope uh, many of you out there who are skeptical are sitting there at the moment sort of shaking your head side to side in a bit of wonderment. Uh, once again, from Seattle, Washington, here is Peter Davenport. Peter? Hi, Art. Hi. Stirring tapes. Really interesting stuff. I have a lot of responses. I've heard these tapes before, of course, in past months and years. But it is proof positive, I feel, that the Air Force clearly addresses the UFO phenomenon seriously. Indeed. And they send hardware out to look at it from in time to indeed. time. Indeed. No question about it. Uh, that, that would have been the case uh, certainly over Edwards. I imagine, as you pointed out earlier, it was probably the case when they had the Phoenix sightings here not long ago. That's my suspicion. That's for sure. I understand that while I was playing those tapes, you were taking a UFO report uh, simultaneously. That is correct. 
which underscores just how busy we can get here on, on certain occasions. But uh, a person who's listening to us in the Sacramento area just called in to report what he and I believe his wife saw while they drove north on I-5 near Walnut Grove or near Sacramento, generally in the Sacramento area, yesterday morning, Saturday morning, the hmm. 31st of January, 1998. Right. They saw an object. As they were driving north on I-5, they saw an object approaching from their right, from the east, eastern sky at 545 in the morning, and they report that they saw the object, which looked like one of these orange street lamps that you see from time to time, descend into a community in near Walnut Grove, California. Really? We are now, or Elk Grove, California, I'm sorry, Elk Grove, California. The object, uh, I'm not going to share with our listeners quite yet what the reported shape of the object was, because if there are any other reports out there, we'd like to get them from those people, from the observers, witnesses. Uh, without without tainting uh, what they might report. Yeah, we try not to contaminate incoming data, of course. But uh, it underscores the fact that this is taking place all the time. The Michigan tape, of course, pops one theory, one myth, that these sightings don't occur on radar, one. Number two, they don't occur around populated areas. Many of our listeners may not know where Holland, Michigan is, but it's right as you pointed out, perhaps right on the eastern shore of Lake Michigan, directly northeast of Chicago, sort of directly east of Milwaukee. And that's right in an area where aircraft coming from the east to land at O'Hare are beginning their descent into the Chicago area. And I think they sighted altitudes of between six and 11,000 feet. That's intermixed with, no doubt, many aircraft, the crews of which may have seen those objects four years ago. Uh, it would be interesting to have some of the um, uh, the control tower tapes yes. uh, that would run simultaneously with this as well. No question about it. I mean, that man watched these objects, well, for how long? For about 30 or 40 minutes we sat here and we listened to the fellow say, look, there they are. Yeah. Oh, my God, uh, look at them. They're, they're, now there's four of them, and uh, they would go, and then they would suddenly re reappear miles and miles and miles uh, uh, farther on. They could cover tens of miles, apparently, in a very, very short period of time. A couple brief stories. One, our center here, my predecessor, Robert Gribble, played a significant role in alerting people out in Michigan as to what was going on. They had, they had taken one call, and Bob Gribble quickly called the state director of Michigan, who in turn, I believe, alerted the National Weather Service rather than the FAA. The FAA does not have much discretionary radar, is my understanding but the National Weather Service does. They can turn on a radar and direct it or focus it in any direction. So they call the right people. Yeah, and that's part of the reason that people were alerted to this. Also, one thing I can add to that Michigan report for, uh, four years ago is at about the same time that that was all occurring over Michigan, we had a dramatic sighting reported to me personally over the University District of Seattle, one of my very good friends from a coffee house where I am a frequent denizen, called me over when I walked into the coffee house that Tuesday night, the 8th of March, 1994, and he said, Peter, have I got a story to tell for you, tell to you. And he said, sit down here and listen to this. Just a few minutes prior, he and a girlfriend had been walking north on the University Avenue in the University District of Seattle. They had had an object come from behind them at altitude, directly overhead. He said it looked like burning magnesium, brighter than a flashbulb that came from the south-southeast, went right over their heads, headed north, and then it did a triple sudden blinking turn, left and right, left and right, then it did a flat 180 degree turn, back to the southeast, and went striking and disappeared behind buildings. And all right, Peter, uh, we've got a break off here. It's the top of the hour. We'll be back with Peter Davenport. More audio for you and your calls. This is Dreamland. <laughs> On Friday morning, my wife and I were on our way home to Bakersfield from Las Vegas. We went through your town of Pahrump, a lot bigger than I thought it would be, as we were going out of the city limits on 372 and crossed into California. Just happened to look up and see an F-117 flying about 200 feet off the ground. It was coming from the southwest, crossed the road above us, moved off to the northeast, 
just to the north of Pahrump. It was flying so slow, perhaps 200 miles an hour at best, and so quiet, I couldn't hear it from our van running. Well, better get great show tonight. Bob listening to uh, KERN in Bakersfield. Once again, from Seattle, Washington, and the UFO Reporting Center, here is Peter Davenport. Peter? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, I know you've got a number of audio uh, clips for us, which I would like to get on the air, and I would also like to take some calls this hour. So whatever you've got, lay it on us. We've got some buttes tonight. You're right. And uh, let me say, while you were receiving that fax, I just took a call over the hotline. In fact, I'd prefer people didn't call us tonight because we're live and we can't take UFO reports while we're on the radio. <laughs> but uh, I took a report from a gentleman who called from Southwest Minster, California. He was reporting his sighting within the last day or two. I don't know the exact date yet. But let's go on to the next audio cut I have. This was made just about two years ago. It comes from Michigan. I don't mean to pick on those folks tonight. We seem to be coming down hard on them. <laughs> but a lot of people, a lot of people think that UFOs are not seen from aircraft or near commercial aircraft. I would like to play for our listeners tonight about a 2 minute and 15 second audio cut of a conversation I had with a commuter pilot from the state of Michigan, from Saginaw, I believe. And we'll leave to our listeners' discretion what this man may have bumped into over Saginaw, Michigan. This was on the 27th of February, 1996, just about two years ago. Let me play what he had to report he and his co-pilot and a plane load of passengers saw about 16,000 feet above Michigan mm -hmm. two years ago. All Here right. we go. Okay. Uh, what did you see? Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, we were uh, between layers of clouds. Uh, there was a layer at about 3,500 feet, which was the tops. Couldn't see any lights from any city. Uh, we went through Cleveland and Detroit. You couldn't see anything. We were in the clear at 16,000 feet. Uh, there was another layer, I'd say about 20,000 feet above us. You couldn't see the moon. Mm -hmm. So we were definitely, uh, you couldn't see any light object from uh, nothing else. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say, now Cleveland would have this better than I would. I, I, I'd reckon we were about 90 miles out of Saginaw, uh, Michigan. Uh -huh. And out of nowhere, it just appeared this big bright white light right in front of us. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, I was concerned that it was going to hit us. You know, I just figured it was another airplane, and we just all of a sudden it turned on its lights, and there it was. Uh, um, it was airborne because uh, we asked for lower. Cause I, I mean, this was at the same altitude as we were, so I, I wanted to get lower. So we started to go lower. Uh -huh. uh, I descended through 9,500 feet, and I was looking at it, and it was above us. Cleveland was trying to get an altitude and location for it, and I said... Uh, I believe something on the tape said I said it was about 10,000 feet. Mm -hmm. And I said, I will guarantee you it is airborne. Mm -hmm. um, well, we were, we were cleared down to uh, 4,000 feet at that time. And uh, I started to level off. And I looked up and it was right in our window again. Mm -hmm. And when it would jump, it was a matter of less than a second. It was over there. But you could see like a, I don't know, flash. Just a little trail of the path it took. The, you know, if if it was just myself and the, my first officer that saw it, uh, to be honest with you, I, I probably wouldn't have said nothing. I told, I probably would have told him to keep his mouth shut because I'm not at getting into all this stuff. But yeah. other aircraft saw it at the same time when I did. There was a Northwest uh, commuter that saw it, and uh, yeah, another pilot or something. It was a ball, uh -huh. and then around it. Like a ring of, um, and uh, the first officer I was flying with, we couldn't even depict a color. It was just fluorescent swirl of bright light. I, I, mm -hmm. Bright, different okay. light. It wasn't like a red or green, nothing. A fluorescent swirl? Fluorescent swirl of white light. Later in the conversation with this uh, this pilot, he described it as a frisbee-looking object with lights around the periphery of it. 
We heard him say that it could streak out, leaving a streak of light in the atmosphere, and then it would streak back so it was right on the nose of his aircraft. He put his aircraft, he requested uh, clearance to descend. He was at 16,000 feet between layers, flying to the northwest over Saginaw, Michigan. He got clearance to descend. He put the nose of the aircraft down. They went through, they hit the tops of overcast below them at 3,000 feet after having descended about 10,000 feet. <laughs> he didn't know what was going to happen in those clouds. When he came out the bottoms of those clouds, the object was gone, fortunately. Anybody, uh, anybody who can sit out in the audience tonight and listen to all of this and not understand that this planet is being visited, uh, I think has a closed mind, Peter. That is my impression, too, Art. And again, my only raison d'etre, the only reason I do this, is to bring to the American public, to those individuals who might like to know what is really going on, bring to them the evidence and the information, thanks to Dreamland and Art Bell, what is really going on on this planet. It is clear that the U.S. government is going to be the last ones to inform the citizens of our country what is really going on and that they know is going on. After my meeting with representatives of the federal government just about seven months ago, I know that they are aware of it. Actually, you didn't tell the Dreamland audience about that. You had two uh, <laughs> representatives of the government uh, who came to see you and identified themselves and said, essentially, what to Well, if I said two, I heard. I'm not sure I've ever identified the number of people with whom I met back in May of 1997. Okay. And we did not meet in Seattle. This was a meeting on the East Coast. They called me in April. They said, we believe that the National UFO Reporting Center may have information that we could find useful. And the principal focus of their interest at that time was TWA 800. They said, we've been to some 400 websites or so. We've settled on yours as perhaps having the information that we're looking for. Hmm. They said, we prefer not to be identified. We do not want the press knocking on our door. Can you meet under those terms? We said, yes, we can. We prefer openness, but if somebody has a need for discretion, we will honor that. That is our policy. I met with them, and as I reported to the Coast to Coast audience, and I will report here again, I feel it's very important, Art. They sat down for a four-hour meeting, and at the very beginning, they said, Peter, let us make our position clear so you understand where we're coming from. A, we know the UFO phenomenon is real. B, we know it is what it appears to be, mainly craft, ships, or objects coming presumably from other parts of our galaxy or the universe. And C, we are a little bit worried about it. That is the reason we're meeting with you. A little bit worried about it. Yes. And if, again, if I were to identify either the individuals and or the entity of the government where they work, 99.9% .9 of our audience tonight would understand immediately with whom I was meeting. Again, they are not the type of people who take a half a day out in a busy schedule to meet with a UFO investigator unless they consider it to be very important. How much of that meeting are you uh, free to disclose? Uh, I will talk about what we discussed openly in a general sense. Um, they posed to me a couple of questions that were a little bit alarming to me. One was, anyway, one question they posed to me was TW800. Again, that was the focus of the meeting, the reason for the meeting they have certain reservations about the information that is coming from the NTSB and the FBI with regard to the reason for that accident. The second question was the one that really shocked me, and I think I can, I can almost duplicate it verbatim. They said, Peter, what evidence does the National UFO Reporting Center have that might suggest that there could be a body of individuals working within the federal government in an extra-constitutional fashion. That is, a group of people who are working independent, perhaps, of the Constitution, uh, let's say in a renegade fashion, although that is my term, that is not their term. Those are questions put to me by, by very prestigious people in the federal government of the United States.
So you gave them essentially all you had that might be relevant? We gave them everything I could provide them in that venue as we will for anybody. We're an open body. We argue that all UFO data should be made available freely to the American public as a service to them. In a sense, Art, I believe that we, the National UFO Reporting Center, and the hundreds and hundreds of other serious-minded UFO investigators and organizations across the country serve as a sentry, if you will, to the American people. We have a responsibility, as no doubt you, Art Bell, feel to your listeners and the American public, to get this information out to people such that they may assess for themselves with hopefully factual and objective data what may be going on right over our heads or under our noses. All right. I want to ask you about this, and we'll treat this subject tenderly, but for years uh, the major reporting agency for things of this sort has been MUFON. Yes. And when you see something, MUFON will send you a form and you will fill it out. I've done it. I had one tremendous sighting of my own, as you well know. I remember two of them. And I, that's right. And, but one really major one with the triangle. Mm -hmm. And I filled out a MUFON report and sent it in and never heard another word. Now, you're very public. You're on my program. You're on, I presume, other programs from yeah. time to time. Mm -hmm. And you willingly uh, tape and put out over the air exactly what you get. Generally, when you file a report with MUFON, it's my experience that it kind of disappears into a black hole, and the public really never hears about it. Mm -hmm. I have heard these comments, but I, I must say uh, that I'm really not comfortable in discussing what other people or, or other organizations do in this field. Only you know, the field is rife with these internecine battles I that know. take place between personalities, and I, first of all, I choose to avoid it. It, it. it drains my energy and wastes my time. Number two, I feel this is not perhaps not the proper venue for airing dirty laundry. Uh, if there would be any in this case. It may be just a matter of bureaucracy, Peter. In other words, your organization is small, fast, reactive. Uh, yep. MUFON is rather large um, and has a, a, a nationwide uh, a bureaucracy. They have done a tremendous service. Walt Andrus in particular. I've interviewed devoted him a number of times, Peter. Decades of his life to see to it that information is collected, that an organization is built, he is to be nothing but highly commended. Would, wouldn't for, you imagine that the people who came to see you would have gone to see the people at MUFON as well? He may ha they may have. I don't know. Uh, I presume MUFON would be as discreet as we try to be, in which case we would have heard nothing from them. We would expect to hear nothing from them under any circumstance mm -hmm. if they made a pledge to, to honor that anonymity of the people who came to us. Okay. And if they you may have gone to other people as well. All right. If you have any other tapes you'd like to share with the audience, let us do that now. At the bottom of the hour, coming out of that, we'll take some phone calls. Why don't I play a short one? Uh, a lot of people think that these UFOs do not appear in uh, settled areas, let's say. Let me play a short tape. I think it's only about a minute or a minute and a half a report we got from a young woman just a mile north of downtown Seattle mm. that in which she reports what she saw on the 2nd of January, Friday night. Here right. we go. All right. Okay, sure. I was on my roof with my telescope looking at the moon, and I was just gazing up in the sky, and there was an airplane that was kind of crossing the moon, and, of course, I was just staring at it. And... Right across where the airplane was flying, of course, the airplane was at a higher altitude than this object. And I'm staring in the sky, and it was this huge-looking, uh, almost boomerang-looking shaped object with about, I would say, 50 to 70 lights. Uh -huh. And they were dull lights. They were about uh, maybe orange-yellow, but very dull, almost like a rust color. And they weren't flashing, and it was just kind of going, moving very slow across the sky. And it was going towards, um, I would say it was going east. Um, maybe not east. But, well, west and, well, I would say east. And it was just kind of moving really slow, and then it kind of went over this golf course that was just built around my area. And it's a really well, 
very illuminated golf course, and when it got to the lights, it just kind of disappeared. I couldn't see the lights anymore. That was a mile south of downtown Seattle. Boy, I must say that we received but one report on this. This is not confirmation of the event. And this young woman was very sincere, very bright. As you can hear, she's very eloquent. Obviously. And she was out testing a new telescope that her boyfriend had given her for Christmas. And if it were not for hundreds of other reports that the UFO Reporting Center here in Seattle has received, much like this. In fact, we got a doozy of a report from England in response to the Coast to Coast program Thursday night or Re Wednesday night. Really? Uh, very, very similar in appearance to what this young woman just described in this audio cut. And we are getting reports of those things from all over the country, in fact, from around the world now, thanks to the Internet and thanks to the Art Bell programs. Uh, this appears to be happening with, I would say, from my standpoint, an alarming frequency. All right. I want to do as I did the other night, and I want to tell everybody in the audience that your organization is a volunteer organization. It's a nonprofit organization. It's an organization that operates on a severe shoestring and if people in the audience would like to donate five or ten bucks, uh, it would be extremely welcome, and it would keep you going. And I think it's very, very important that you keep going. If, in fact, uh, you should be able to add to your staff, if anything, and uh, you're an incredibly valuable resource. So I would like you to give the phone number and or... Uh, the address where people could send five or ten bucks, uh, and I know you don't want more than that. That is correct from the standpoint of independence, and it's terribly kind of your art to mention that issue. One of the things we'd like to do is vastly increase the amount of data we can take in and get back out to the American people. We take no salaries, but let me give that address now quickly, Please. if I may, and we'll give it again maybe later before the end of the program. Sure, go ahead. It's the National UFO Reporting Center, P.O. Box 456. Two, three. Next line is University Station. That's a post office in Seattle. And it's Seattle, Washington. And the zip code is 98145. And I am terribly grateful to not only you, but to those many people who have now sent very modest contributions to us. That's going to allow us to do a great deal more work. I understand. Uh, once again, the, the um, National uh, UFO Reporting Center, PO Box 45623. University Station, Seattle, Washington, and what's the zip code, please? The zip code is 98145. One, 98145. Very good. All right, uh, hold tight, Peter. We're at the bottom of the hour. We're going to come back. If you have any more um, tape reports, we'll get those out and then go to the phones. How's that? We do have some. All right. Uh, stay right where you are. I'm Art Bell. This is Dreamland. You from Jerry Glass, the state section director of MUFON in Riverside County, California. Okay. He says, let me say on the outset, Peter Davenport buys the official story. But many within MUFON do not. On April 9th, Dr. Stephen Greer was holding hearings in Washington, D.C. An A-10 was missing. Heaven's Gate debacle was taking place. Cheyenne Mountain was closed down. At the same time, an airliner traveling from Alaska to San Francisco spotted a gigantic UFO. It was sighted from the ground. A GOES-9 satellite picked up and photographed a UFO purported to be 25 miles in length. The satellite photo later said to be a computer glitch. However, it was picked up on the satellite's five different sensors, including heat-seeking. Therefore, it could not have been an illusion. Best regards, Jerry Glass, State Section Director, MUFON, Riverside uh, uh, County, California. Yeah. Uh, it's an interesting comment, and I would probably agree with a lot of what he says. I believe at this stage, Art, that the news that we broke over your program may have been in error on the GOES-9 satellite. I talked to the very engineer who built the satellite, who was quite familiar with the data telemetry system, and I am satisfied tentatively that that engineer knew exactly what he was talking about, and he, we stand corrected by what he has shared with us. It looks as though that was a data drop. When the system uh, does not send telemetry accurately because of a check uh, in the system, it just drops that data. And it is my belief at this stage, without proof, that what we reported over 
uh, coast to coast that night was probably an error, but it was based on four or five solid pieces of evidence with regard to sightings off the coast of California, a missing TR-1 or a U-2 reconnaissance aircraft. Whether that's confirmed or not, I don't know, but I don't believe one was lost. I'm not sure. But, uh, yeah, he makes a, the, the writer of that fax makes some very good points. There was a lot going on back in that, uh, that time. All right, very good. Do you have any further audio clips you want to play for us? I think you do. We do. I have about a... Let's go into the issue of close encounters of some variety that may be taking place. I believe they're taking place between human beings on this planet and other creatures, let's call them. What I'm going to play is actually in honor of uh, Linda Howe. She's the one who investigated this. She was the one who broke it on Dreamland one night about two years ago. This is a short, I think it's about a two-minute clip of a very, very strange interaction that took place near Doylestown, Pennsylvania, just north of Philadelphia. A lot of people think still that these sightings are not occurring over major metropolitan areas, and everybody still, many people still think that those meteors are meteors. Let's play a clip, about two minutes, of what happened to a young fellow just north of Doylestown. I think he's on Route 313 out of Doylestown. Here we go. All right. What happened? Oh, well, okay. This is the best I can describe it. I was I was driving my van east on route. I wrote it all down. Mm -hmm. um, I was driving my van east on Route 313 in Bedminster Township, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Where is that roughly? East or west? It's south um, southeast Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, Doyle, it's near Doylestown, Pennsylvania. Okay. And it was approximately 2:30. A.M. Yeah. Uh, first thing I saw was three shooting stars, one right after the other. They were very, very bright. Mm -hmm. Like the brightest I'd seen. Mm -hmm. They were right in front of me. They were off in the sky in the distance. So I just thought, cool, you know, shooting stars. Yeah. Didn't mm -hmm. think a whole lot of it. Mm -hmm. um, I was driving down the road. A couple. It was like two or three minutes after that. They were bluish green in color. Um, I was driving my truck when all of a sudden the engine in my truck turned off. Mm -hmm. The lights came off in my truck. I was going down a hill, mm -hmm. a steep hill, mm -hmm. but the truck stopped. Mm -hmm. It stopped kind of abruptly, but my body wasn't thrown forward into the windshield or anything. I was, it, everything just stopped. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how else to describe this except I felt something move through my truck. Really? You ever go to a rock and roll concert? Uh, years ago, yes. Okay, you ever, you ever see one of these laser beams that shoot out across the... the oh, yeah, sure. Okay, it kind of... It felt like that, but only it wasn't some... I might seem a little hysterical right now, sorry. Um, I'm sure, I know they're upsetting. It can be upsetting experiences. Well, what freaked me out was... Um, after that happened, after I felt something pass through the truck, I couldn't move my body. Mm -hmm. I went to turn my ignition. The first thing I thought was that I made my truck start, you know? And I went to turn my ignition. At first, I reached up and I turned my ignition key and nothing happened. I mean, it didn't click, it didn't anything. The truck was on the hill and it was stopped dead. Mm -hmm. um, then I felt this thing that I could only describe that way. There was no color to it. It just that's the only way I can describe it. Mm -hmm. and, and I couldn't move my hand. I went to turn the key and I couldn't move my hand. Mm -hmm. um, mm. I wasn't scared or anything at the time. I was perfectly calm. Yeah. Um, I don't know, I guess maybe I was in shock or something. That was two years ago, <laughs> Doylestown, Pennsylvania, and we have many reports like this. It's not just one or two or a handful, Art. We have many reports like this. This gentleman, whom we just listened to, sounded very sincere to me. We could hear the alarm, perhaps even the shock in his voice. This call came in about 1 o'clock in the morning, about 4 o'clock his time. He could not go to sleep after this incident. Now, I'm not surprised the government's knocking on your door. Yeah. Um, it's certainly taking place. And again, I think it's imperative that the American people understand this. This incident, by the way, occurred just 
two days before that incident over Saginaw, Michigan, the tape that we played just before the break. These were very close to one another. This was the night of the 24th or 25th of February 1996, and that incident with the commuter airliner occurred on the 27th of February 1996. Whether there's any correlation between these two incidents or not, I can only guess. But it's taking place. One short addendum to that incident over Saginaw with the commuter airliner, a major newspaper article was written by the largest newspaper, by a journalist at the largest newspaper in Ohio. I don't know that we have to name names here. But he wrote an elegant article. He talked to the pilot. He somehow obtained an early copy, an unofficial copy, of the radio communication between that aircraft and the FAA in both Cleveland and elsewhere. Really? It was handled by several centers. The journalist listened to the tapes. He talked to the pilot. He talked to the...